Yeah, so it is a strangely specific uh, title. Um, the reasons for it will become clear in a, a couple of minutes. So um, the, one of the projects I'm working on is a sort of uh, philosophical um, commentary on Einstein's cosmology paper of 1917. So I think it's an interesting paper because of its uh, you know, tremendous influence, also uh, because of its deeply flawed nature um, um, uh, from a physics point of view, um, and also because it's uh, a very philosophical paper. Um, so um, you know, just to remind you, in his cosmology paper of 1917, Einstein argued in favor of the finitude of space presented the first relativistic cosmological model, which was eternal and time independent. Therein lay the flaw. It's also, it turns out, unstable, and so not really suitable as a cosmological representation, um, and concluded uh, that the equations of general relativity had to be altered. Right? And in, you know, so the founding of relativistic cosmology is one of the legacies of the paper, um, the introduction of the cosmological constant, uh, uh, which, which was, uh, the means by which he altered the original equations is the other great legacy of the paper, scientific legacy. So um, <clears throat> I think it's uh, helpful to think of the paper as structured around an argument for the idea that space is finite rather than infinite. And the argument uh, uh, is um, extremely appealing in its simplicity. So the first premise is that we must supplement the differential equations of general relativity by limiting conditions at spatial infinity if we regard the universe as being of uh, infinite spatial extent. And that's an interesting and controversial claim um, that I'm not gonna talk about today. Uh, second main premise, the most obvious way of supplementing uh, the equations of general relativity by boundary conditions would be to require that space become Euclidean if you go far enough away from a central region, asymptotic uh, flatness at spatial infinity. Einstein claims that that obvious way of supplementing the equations has three undesirable consequences. It violates the principle of general covariance, or as he called it at the time, the principle of relativity. It violates Mach's principle, uh, which at the time he took to be uh, integral to uh, general relativity. And uh, it would be impossible to have stable uh, conglomerations of matter for reasons from uh, deriving from statistical physics. And then third premise, it appears that no other acceptable, there are no other acceptable boundary conditions. So we have to give up on the idea that space is infinite. And so in the, the, the project that I'm working on, to, which I won't talk about more after this slide, um, is sort of structured around this argument and there'll be hopefully five papers or chapters to, uh, um, corresponding to each of the um, premises here, one, two A, B, C, and three. Um, so today I just want to talk about the sense in which um, I want to talk about the particular version of Mach's principle that Einstein had in mind at this time. Um, so um, just to uh, get in the, as a sort of approach to the spirit of what he was up to, I mean, let's contrast um, the sort of typical modern way of thinking of general activity encapsulated by Misner, Thorne, and Wheeler in their aphorism that space tells matter how to move and matter tells space how to curve. Okay, this nice uh, dualistic, very symmetric uh, way of thinking about general relativity. Contrast that with the way Einstein was thinking about general relativity in the early days. So uh, this is from a letter to Mach in 1913, uh, but he continues uh, to think in these terms uh, through the uh, teens, at least. It seems to me absurd to ascribe physical properties to space. The totality of masses produce the GUV field, the gravitational field, we would call it the metric field, which in turn governs the course of all processes, including the propagation of light rays and the behavior of measuring rods and clocks. And so just to make the contrast with Misner, Thorne, and Wheeler clear, I think you might uh, paraphrase this as saying that according to Einstein, matter tells matter how to move. Um, space is not a main player. Geometry is not a main player in the geometry in the sense that Misner, Thorne, and Wheeler have in mind. 
Um, another sort of more Baroque paraphrase would be, whereas for Newton, space and time were emanative effects of God, for Einstein, space-time is an emanative effect of matter. Okay, so um, the, it seems like one of the things Newton was trying to get at by uh, describing space and time as emanative effects of God is the idea that um, although they necessarily coexist with God, God is in some sense responsible for them rather than vice versa. Einstein has the same picture uh, with regards to the relation between uh, matter and space-time, it seems. Uh, so the symmetry that Misner, Thorne, and Wheeler see is absent in Einstein's thinking. So here's <clears throat> the closest thing we have to an official formulation of Mach's principle from Einstein from this particular period. So this is in uh, his famous reply to Kretschmann of 1918. Um, Einstein says, the G field is completely determined by the masses of the bodies. Since mass and energy are, according to the special theory of relativity, the same, and since energy is formally described by the symmetric uh, uh, energy tensor, it follows that the G field is conditioned and determined by the energy tensor of matter. And so this is, um, this is something he explicitly labels as Mach's principle in this paper. Now, there's a few things to note about this. First of all, it's, it's not really very much at all like anything that Mach himself ever said. Um, and there were other uh, Einstein's Mach's principles before 1916 and after 1918. So this is not typical for, for a typical formulation from Einstein's entire career, but it is it does encapsulate the way he was thinking about it in a brief period, critical period, 1917 and 1918. Um, and maybe this is most crucial from the point of view of avoiding misunderstandings. It, it has nothing to do with rotation. So earlier and later forms of Mach's principle in Einstein's mind did have to do with rotation, crucially. But this form does not, strictly speaking. So I mean, here's, um, here's a fact about general relativity. If you have a homogeneous solution of the Einstein dust equations, so the geometry looks the same at every point, with vanishing shear and, extent, and expansion, um, then your solution has to either be the Einstein static universe or Gödel space-time. Um, so uh, plausibly, you can characterize the girdle geometry in terms of its material degrees of freedom alone. Um, so it's not a counterexample to the present form of Einstein's Mach's principle, although it is a classic counterexample to forms of Mach's principle that do have to do with rotation. Okay, so for, for later forms of Mach's principle, girdle's uh, solution is a counterexample, but not to this one, so, because this one really has nothing to do with rotation intrinsically. Okay, that was the preamble. So um, I guess it's a philosophy talk, so we need a distinction uh, between two forms, uh, two interpretations that we might give to Einstein's official statement. So Einstein's clearly committed uh, at least to the following. Okay, so here's the weak mock einstein principle. Space-time geometry supervenes on the disposition of matter over time. Okay, so not at an instant necessarily, but if you look at an entire solution. So some people hate, especially in philosophy of physics, some people hate the uh, vocabulary of supervenience. So let me rephrase the same point in other dialects. This is meant, the other formulations are meant to be completely equivalent um, uh, to each other and to the supervenience formulation. Here's one, fixing the history of the distribution of matter fixes the space-time geometry. Or uh, there's only one space-time geometry consistent with any given history of matter. Or uh, the degrees of freedom of the matter geometry system are exhausted by the matter degrees of freedom. The geometry part doesn't have any independent degrees of freedom of its own. OK, <clears throat> that's a weak form that just uh, identifies the sense in which matter depends on geometry. I'm sorry, geometry depends on matter with supervenience. Um, I'm going to argue that uh, that isn't what Einstein had in mind. So uh, there's extra bonus slides after the talk if you want further uh, arguments for this, but here's just uh, one plank of my argument. So clearly one way to specify the disposition of matter over time is to say that there is none ever, right? So to say I'm, only, I'm talking about a vacuum solution. Now it's consistent with the weak uh, form of the Mach-Einstein principle that there should be a ground state of the gravitational field that obtains in that case, right? 
once you fix the material degrees of freedom by saying nothing's happening, okay, it's consistent with the weak mock Einstein principle that there should be an empty space time solution. There couldn't be more than one, but there could be one. And so even the weak form of the mock Einstein principle rules out the possibility of multiple vacuum solutions, but the weak form does not rule out the possibility of a single vacuum solution that's physically relevant when there's no matter. But it's clear that Einstein has something stronger in mind. So in his reply to Kretschmann again, uh, he asserts that his original field equations violate Mach's principle, you know, as he understands it, because they countenance uh, Minkowski space time as a vacuum solution. Okay, so he thinks it's a flaw. Uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's inconsistent with Mach's principle to allow there to be any space time when there's no matter. Um, um, and in a paper submitted one day later about De Sitter, the two papers are clearly very closely related. Uh, he says, if the De Sitter solution were valid everywhere, it would show that the introduction of the lambda term, the cosmological constant, uh, did not fulfill the purpose that I intended. Because in my opinion, the general theory of relativity is a satisfying theory only if it shows that the physical qualities of space are completely determined by the matter alone. Therefore, no metric field must exist. That is, no space-time continuum is possible without the matter that generates it. Okay, so again, we have the idea that in a, in um, a theory of the broad type of general relativity that obeys Mach's principle, there must be no vacuum solutions whatsoever. So clearly inconsistent with the weak form of the Mach's, of, uh, Mach's principle. So the same idea has been floating around in Einstein's mind for a few years. Here he is. Here's something he wrote to Schwarzschild in uh, 1916. It can be put jokingly this way. If I allow all things to vanish from the world, then following Newton, the Galilean inertial space remains. Following my interpretation, nothing remains. And he liked this, uh, this way of putting things. And um, he used it on his first trip to America in 1921 uh, on some journalists, and it led to the following headline. Okay, so we need something stronger than the weak Mach Einstein principle. So um, I'm just going to suggest here, uh, we can talk about more in the question period, that what Einstein has in mind is something along the following lines. Facts about space-time geometry, including, for instance, facts about the trajectories of freely falling bodies, supervene on the facts about the distribution and motions of material bodies. So far, we just have the weak Einstein, the weak formula, because this is the extra part the former sort of facts are wholly explanatorily dependent on the latter sort of facts. Okay, so we have supervenience plus a reason for the supervenience, namely some sort of asymmetric explanatory dependence. Okay, so I allow that this is a vague formulation and I think it's an interesting project to um, make it more precise. Um, I'm not gonna spend much time on that here. Um, I do want to say that I don't think the notion, the relevant notion of explanatory dependence could be causal in a, for Einstein. Um, and I can talk about that in the question period if you want. Um, so on this sort of view, geometric facts are genuine facts, right? Uh, but they're ontologically derivative upon more fundamental facts about matter. Okay, so here's some texts in support of this suggestion. So uh, first of all, we had the letter from Mach from 1913 that I already talked about. Here are a couple of texts from 1920. Um, I think this is from a letter to Schlick. According to the general theory of relativity, physical space has reality, but not an independent one, in that its properties are fully determined by matter. So here we have this linking of the idea that um, uh, there's some things that exist, but uh, they don't exist in sort of the most you know, full-blooded way, um, because their property, because they depend completely on some other category of thing. Uh, and here's something from an unpublished manuscript. Uh, in he's talking about relative, you know, in the status of space or ether in relativity theory. So at this point, he's you know, uh, begun to uh, think, oh yeah, the ether is what we're talking about when we talk about the metric. Uh, so in relativity theory, it's by no, the ether or space is by no means homogeneous and its state has no independent existence, but rather depends on the field generating matter. 
Since the metric facts can no longer be separated in the new theory from the physical facts proper, the concepts of space and ether flow into each other. Since the properties of space appear to be conditioned by matter, space is no longer a precondition for matter in the new theory. The theory of space geometry can no longer be treated before or developed independently of mechanics and gravitation. Okay, so, I mean, uh, that's basically what I have to say by way of interpreting um, uh, Einstein's formulation of Mach's principle. Um, you know, sort of, uh, I think there's a natural um, question to ask. It's like, uh, yeah, okay, but does general relativity obey uh, this principle or not? Um, so um, let's start by way of a warm up with thinking about the parallel question about Maxwell's theory. Um, oh, I guess I should start with this slide instead. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna ask, does the weak, does, does the Mach-Einstein principle hold in general relativity? I'll mostly be talking about the weak form because I, I'm unclear um, exactly how the strong form differs. Um, that's uh, an open question. Um, and here's the way I'm thinking about, uh, you know, asking philosophical questions about general relativity. You know, interesting universal generalizations about general relativity are typically false. Um, there's like anything you say, there's going to be some uh, counterexamples almost if, if the claim you were making was a, a, an interesting one in the first place. But it's often profitable to ask just what sort of counterexamples there are. Okay, so I'm I am going to present some counterexamples to Einstein's Mach's principle, but I don't think that sort of settles the, the interesting question. The interesting question is like how wide a swath of uh, the possibilities described by general relativity are governed by this principle. Um, the fact that there's some counterexamples leaves open, I think, uh, uh, interesting questions. Okay, as a warm up, let's talk about Maxwell's theory just so to clarify sort of what the ground rules are for this kind of project. So. Uh, you know, there's a natural analog of the Mach-Einstein principle governing uh, electromagnetism. You could say the disposition over time of discrete charged matter determines the electromagnetic field. That's that's very closely parallel um, to, to the Mach-Einstein principle as Einstein was understanding it in 1917 and 18. Warning, you might expect somebody who uh, thought, you know, believed in uh, the Mach-Einstein principle concerning gravity and matter uh, to also naturally uh, believe the corresponding principle governing the relationship between charge matter and the electromagnetic field. But Einstein did not uh, embrace the electromagnetic version of the th uh, uh, principle at all um, in this period or earlier or later. Uh, so there's a kind of tension uh, in his uh, thinking at this time. Okay, so here's one way to think about um, Maxwell's theory. Uh, you know, there's all kinds of conceptual and uh, mathematical problems uh, because of the self-interaction of charged matter. Um, so you've got to make some choices in order to set up a consistent, mathematically well-behaved uh, formulation of Maxwell's theory in which there's genuine in, uh, interactions, including self-interactions between charged particles. So here's one way to do it. Uh, we can get a well-behaved theory that includes self-interaction by following Abraham, uh, one of uh, Einstein's contemporaries. Work with extent particles that are rigid spheres in a preferred frame. So this is uh, a, a very nice theory of uh, electromagnetism that is not fully relativistic because um, you have to designate a preferred frame in which these um, uh, particles take on a spherical shape. So obviously the supervenience of the history of the electromagnetic field on the distribution of matter fails radically in the vacuum case where there is no charged matter, right? Because there's gonna be an infinite dimensional family of vacuum solutions of Maxwell's equations in which there's sometimes there, there might be nothing happening or there might be all kinds of source-free radiation propagating around. And so, um, you can say there's no charge matter uh, anywhere ever, and that does not just working with the equations of the theory settle uh, what's going on in the electromagnetic uh, field. But plausibly, if you're interested in this approach, 
Um, what you're really interested in is the solutions in which there is some charged matter. And the simplest such solution is going to involve um, a single charge permanently at rest. Right? And then you expect that hopefully the only electric magnetic field consistent with that distribution of charged matter is uh, the ordinary Coulomb, exterior Coulomb field of a particle at rest. Okay, so if there are other electromagnetic uh, solutions of Maxwell's equation consistent with specifying that there is a charged body at rest um, that is the source of uh, the field, then the electromagnetic version of the Mach Einstein principle fails. Okay, why do I say uh, plausibly the only field consistent with a single charged particle eternally at rest is uh, uh, the nice one? Well, think about it this way. If the exterior field, the field exterior to this charge isn't spherically symmetric, then eventually the charge um, should, you know, some kind of uh, anisop anisotropy in the exterior field will eventually propagate over and hit the charge and the charge will accelerate. But we said it was eternally at rest. So there's a sort of plausibility argument that there can't, that the exterior field would have to be spherically symmetric. And if the field is spherically symmetric, then an electromagnetic analog of Birkhoff's theorem uh, concerning general relativity guarantees that it just has to be the Coulomb field. Okay, so there's, that's not, uh, that's merely a plausibility argument. Um, it's, uh, I believe, uh, an open question for people who work on um, the Abraham approach uh, 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 to electrodynamics, uh, whether or not the, the plausibility argument really works, but it does have a certain amount of plausibility. So basically, if this uh, approach sketched here does work, then we've managed to prove that the Mach Einstein, the electromagnetic version of the Mach Einstein principle holds in one extremely simple case. Right, the most simple, interesting case for people interested in the electromagnetic Mach Einstein principle. Now, if it doesn't work, that's because there's some surprising way of evading uh, the point uh, one above. Right? There's some surprising way to have an exterior field that isn't spherically symmetric, and yet the particle at rest at the origin never feels that. Um, now, it's at least if we find out that if that does happen. It seems like one option open to us is um, to engage in you know, a little theft rather than honest toil uh, and add a postulate to our physical theory that says that exterior fields have to share the symmetries of their sources, say. Right? So this would be modifying Maxwell's theory in order to ensure that it obeyed uh, the Mach-Einstein principle. Okay, so that's this is one of the ground rules to keep in mind that um, if you do find a counterexample, there may be uh, additional physical postulates that you would be open to adding if you have some reason for thinking that the Mach Einstein principles, you know, sums up some important physics. Okay, good. So let's get down to general relativity. So in the vacuum case, we have the same dialectic we had in the uh, electromagnetic case. So one way to specify the history of massive matter is to say that there is none anywhere ever. This is consistent with many different space-time geometries, right? There's lots of uh, geometrically different vacuum solutions. Uh, so the Mach-Einstein principle radically fails, unless we're willing to say that all of these geometries are unphysical or that all but one of them are. Now, that may seem like a very high price to pay since we do, all, in applications, we use uh, vacuum solutions all the time to model things that we're interested in. I'm not sure it really is, though. Um, you know, there is matter in our universe. And so to, if we are relying on a vacuum solution to uh, model some uh, subsystem of the universe, we've got to hope that there's a more realistic model that includes matter, um, or there's a very fundamental problem with general relativity. Okay, so here's some positive results. Some results, sort of the analogs of the um, uh, single particle at rest in the electromagnetic case. So here's, um, you know, the first substantive test of the Mach-Einstein principle comes in the one body case in general relativity. Even there, it's very far from trivial. So the natural place to start uh, is with a static isolated body in just in the case where there's no cosmological constant, the very sort of 
most basic uh, case that people were began um, trying to model um, in 1916, 1917, 1918. So uh, here's what's known about this case. Um, say we describe, we decide to model a star as a blob of fluid. Okay, so we consider a static, isolated blob of perfect fluid with constant mass density and uh, fixed total mass. The constant mass density isn't crucial to this example, but it simplifies life. Okay, so um, this is, we're imagining it's in some kind of equilibrium, so it's static, right? It just sits there. Um, the geometry within the blob is always the same. The matter configuration within the blob is always the same. Um, constant mass density for this uh, sake of simplicity and fixed total mass um, also um, just to give us some analytic control. Then we know, and this is not obvious, but required many years of work from uh, 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 people investigating this problem, that if the exterior metric is both static and asymptotically flat at spatial infinity, then the blob must be a sphere. Okay, so this was the hard thing to prove. And then, uh, you know, you know from uh, Birkhoff's uh, theorem that the exterior metric must be Schwarzschild. Okay, so, um, so long as we know that the exterior metric has to be static and asymptotically flat, then we know that there can only be one possible exterior metric for a fluid star. Okay, here's another, um, uh, a, a slightly, a, a quite, conceptually quite different approach um, that leads to the same kind of conclusion. So in this case, we're considering elastic bodies rather than uh, uh, fluid bodies. So there's at least, um, yeah, there's certainly more shapes that are open. Like they're not, they're gonna have equilibrium configurations that aren't, uh, don't have spherical symmetry or don't have any symmetry whatsoever. So here's how you do it. Uh, here, here's how the result goes. Set Einstein's constant to zero. So turn gravity off specify a compact elastic body and equilibrium in Euclidean space. Okay, so there's many, many ways you could do that because an elastic body can, uh, that's not stressed in any way, could have almost any shape, depending, you know, you just cut out a piece of material in any shape you want. Then, uh, for each sufficiently small epsilon, there's a unique static space-time asymptotically flat at spatial infinity and vacuum exterior to an elastic body uh, that represents the de deformation of our reference body when uh, we turn on gravity to some small number. Okay, so, I mean, you can sort of picture like, I mean, imagine my reference body was sort of like a shape of, I, I had, a, I, I cut it out to be like, have the shape of headphones, right, earphones. So two blobs and then a kind of loop thing up here. The reference body would be fine. It would just be sitting there, no strains, nothing, nothing's going on. As you turn gravity higher and higher, obviously, um, in order to have an equilibrium, you're going to have to um, deform the reference body, right? So, uh, uh, if if the loop kind of thing is kind of a spring that's pushing the earphone parts apart, I mean you're going to get the gravity is going to tend to make the earphone parts come closer together and you're going to have more and more stress in the loopy part. Okay. Um, so each of these B epsilons is in general going to have a different shape from the reference body. But the result tells you that as long as that at least for small values, if, gra if gravity is not strong, then there's always only one way of pasting on an exterior geometry that's static and asymptotically flat at spatial infinity. So here's the moral from these two examples. If we're able to prove or willing to just stipulate that the geometry exterior to an isolated body must be asymptotically flat and have the same symmetries as the given body, then the Mach-Einstein principle holds for certain kinds of isolated bodies. Okay, so we need both conditions, right? Because we want to at least say that the exterior has to be static. Um, we're allowed to, if we, add a principle that says, okay, the exterior has to have the symmetries of the given body and the body is static, then we get that the exterior has to be static too. So we need static and asymptotically flat at spatial infinity. So let's set aside for today the question of whether the field equations imply that the geometry exterior to a static isolated body must be asymptotically flat. In fact, they don't. Um, if you're interested, you can ask me about that in the question period. 
Um, I mean, plausibly, this is the same kind of move we made in the Maxwell case. The geometry exterior, exterior to a spherically symmetric body should be spherically symmetric, right? In the electromagnetic case, we said, otherwise, you know, wouldn't the body feel the anisotropy in the exterior field eventually, and then fail to maintain its spherical symmetry? So that, that move uh, still feels plausible in the relativity case, although, of course, you know, it's always perilous um, uh, to, be, to generalize things from basically the special relativistic setting to the general relativistic setting. And we'll see that things can go wrong at this stage. So plausibly for the same reason, the uh, geometry exterior to a static body should be static. And okay, we'll see again that things can go wrong with this. Okay, uh, I'm gonna get to the, some counterexamples in a minute, but first of all, I, I wanna talk about uh, a point that I know from experience. Um, several of you have probably been um, agitated over. There's uh, uh, a point um, um, as soon as I state the Mach Einstein principle, I think there's some people are tempted to say, ah, it obviously just doesn't make sense uh, for a very straightforward reason. So um, Einstein himself eventually came to think this. So I want to um, say, I want to defend the early Einstein against the late Einstein. Uh, and I guess it turns out I uh, in this, I'm uh, in uh, company with uh, Dennis Shama. So here's a, a recollection of his. I had the privilege of discussing th this question, Mox principle, with Einstein only a few weeks before he died. It was the end of my year's in a visit. Uh, to help ease my tension, I started the discussion with a prepared sentence. Professor Einstein, I would like to talk about Mox principle, and I have come to defend your former self against your later self. Fortunately, he laughed. Uh, at this rather feeble beginning, and said, that is good, yeah. <laughs> but our substance discussion was rather inconclusive and soon wandered onto other topics. Okay, so what, what, what did Shama have in mind? He had in mind, I, um, I mean, some th things, some remarks of Einstein that had been published in his intellectual autobiography, but also uh, remarks, there are also remarks in a famous letter to Pirani, and I have no idea whether Shana, Shama had seen that letter or not, but um, this letter to Pirani is probably the best source uh, for Einstein's, late Einstein's worries about early Einstein's Mach's principle. So uh, Pirani has written to Einstein, this is 1952 or something, um, asking about Mach's principle, and Einstein says, well, Mach sought to abolish space and replace it by the relative mutual inertia of ponderable bodies. That certainly, certainly did not work. And then he goes on, when people today speak about Mach's principle, they do not mean to abolish the continuum, but to preserve the field. But they think that the field ought to be completely determined by the matter. Okay, so like he once had. This is, however, a ticklish affair. For the stress energy tensor, uh, which is supposed to represent matter, always presupposes the metric tensor. Okay, so. It's this notion of presupposing here that makes people think, ah, so it, it actually doesn't make any sense to say that the matter determines the geometry because you can't specify the matter without presupposing the metric. Um, Einstein continues, in my opinion, we ought not to speak of the Machian principle anymore. It pre proceeds from the time in which one thought that the ponderable bodies were the only physical reality and that all elements that could not be fully determined by them ought to be avoided in theory, in the theory. I'm well aware that for a long time, I too was influenced by this idée fixe. Okay, so here's a formulation of the worry from uh, Jürgen Ehlers. Um, I think it's, it's um, yeah, superbly, superbly clear. If you have a stress en energy tensor and not a metric, then this does not meaningfully describe matter. There is no theory of physics so far which can describe matter without already the metric as an ingredient of the description of matter. Therefore, within existing theories, the statement that the matter by itself determines the metric is neither wrong nor false, but is meaningless. Right? And I think it's, it's not much of a stretch to think that this is, Einstein would have agreed with all of this, including the very last part about meaninglessness, given the language of presupposition uh, that he was using in his letter to Pirani. Okay, so here's my reconstruction of Ehlers and Einstein. Okay, uh, look. Matter energy, ma sorry, matter enters the field equations only through the stress energy tensor. That's true. So to say that matter determines the space time geometry is to say that there's only one metric consistent with a given stress energy tensor. 
But the stress energy tensor depends on the spacetime metric as well as on the variables describing the matter content of spacetime. So in general relativity, it makes no sense to speak of some way that matter might be distributed as determining or failing to determine the geometry of spacetime. Okay. I don't think that's actually should be as compelling as it might appear at first sight. So for one thing, notice that the argument isn't sound. It makes sense because it's false to say that the null distribution of matter determines the space-time metric. And so it just can't be that it never makes sense to say that a distribution of matter determines the metric. More generally, above, I gave you a pair of tricks uh, for specifying the matter distribution that don't seem to involve directly uh, specifying the stress energy tensor, and which do not seem to require that the space-time metric has been specified in advance. That may seem fishy to you. Here's my attempt uh, to remove the fishiness. Okay, I can say there's a blob of incompressible fluid of total mass m and, ma and constant mass density rho without having first specified a space-time metric. I know that because I know that this, this claim makes sense either in Newtonian physics or in general relativity. So it can't be that I have to specify a space-time metric in order to talk about a blob of mass m and density rho. I mean, you might worry, ah, are we really, is it really the same property of mass in general relativity and in Newtonian physics? Or is it, you know, are those different properties? I, I don't know, honestly. Um, and I think for present purposes, it, it, it shouldn't matter. Uh, all that matters is that there's properties in each theory that play these functional operational roles. And that's what uh, we're specifying uh, in describing the blob of fluid. Okay, even if you don't buy that, here's a fallback position for, you know, that I think should remove whatever remains of the worry uh, from Ehlers and Einstein, Ehlers and the late Einstein. The worst case would be we can't specify the state of matter without also specifying the geometry of that part of space-time that's occupied by matter. But even in this case, you know, there's still an interesting question, which is sort of like the residual part of the uh, Mach-Einstein principle, even if you give up on, even if you allow that Ehlers and Einstein are right about what they've said. Because it's a substantive question whether there's ever more than one inextendable vacuum exterior solution consistent with a good given way of specifying the material and geometric degrees of freedom in a given area. So now, like, let it be the case that the question is, I've got a blob, uh, it's constant mass density, uh, uh, it's, it's, this is its total mass, and here's the interior geometry. Still, Right, the spirit behind the original Mach-Einstein principle is to ask, okay, is there more than one exterior consistent with that? Um, and it's not obvious. Okay, here are the promised counterexamples. So let's start with um, bringing Lambda back onto the stage. So in order to construct his eternal time-independent spatially uh, finite cosmology, Einstein added a term to his equations that gives space-time a repulsive tendency. So unchecked, it leads to exponential spatial expansion. So here's a picture of De Sitter space-time, the basic vacuum solution uh, in the positive lambda sector of general relativity. So sort of the analog of Minkowski space-time, just as highly symmetric. Uh, and because of the repulsive tendency inherent in lambda, you know, if you start with at a given time with space of a given volume, space will expand exponentially as you go into the future. I mean, and so in order to have had it at that size at T0, it must have, you know, also expand exponentially towards the past. So contrary to Einstein's attention, intentions, uh, adding lambda the, to the theory actually makes it much easier to find counterexamples to the Mach-Einstein principle. So indeed, in the lambda, a positive lambda regime, an isolated static spherically symmetric perfect fluid star admits more than one inextendable exterior geometry. So that wasn't true when lambda is zero. It is true when lambda is positive. So this is like in many, many ways, uh, you know, the adding lambda to the theory was like a brilliant move, but it undermined uh, many of the ideas that Einstein had about what general relativity was and how it worked. And this is an example. So, um, Here's a diagram of a positive lambda universe containing two stars. So the stars are the world tubes of the stars are these dark gray regions. So uh, you know immediately exterior to each star, you have something that um, 
has Schwarzschild to sitter geometry. So, I mean, it looks a lot like the sitter geometry, except it's um, it knows about this mass here. Um, um, so uh, regions one and four, the regions immediate, immediately exterior to each of the two stars are static regions. Uh, regions uh, two and three are regions in which space is undergoing exponential expansion or contraction. Um, so in particular, uh, the positive lambda field equations don't imply that the exterior of a static body has to be static. Because, uh, you know, one and two here are the exterior of this body, but uh, one and two together is not a static space time. Um, and um, so there's there's one possible uh, uh, geometry for two stars. If you are obsessed in this and the next slide with there just being one star instead, um, you could quotient around this vertical uh, line here uh, and get just a universe that just had one star and in which uh, spatial geometry was like basically elliptic rather than spherical. Um, we don't have to talk about that more if people aren't interested in it. So this is one possible exterior for that matter configuration. Here's a second possible exterior for the same matter configuration. It's basically the same kind of thing, except um, it also contains a black hole uh, up here and a white hole down here. And in fact, once you see the relation between the diagram on the preceding page and the diagram on this page, you see that if you've got two stars that are static, you can put as many black holes as you want in between them. Um, so there's actually an infinite family of uh, exteriors consistent with the original specification of the matter distribution. And again, if you want there to just be one star, we can quotient, so there's only one star. Okay, so that's a straight up counterexample to the Mach-Einstein principle uh, that explodes, exploits at a global structure that's made possible by the introduction of lambda. Uh, here's another counterexample. This is a lambda equals zero counterexample. Um, it also exploits a global structure that would never have occurred to Einstein at the time. Um, again, it's going to involve uh, black holes and white holes. Okay, so now we're going to have a single uh, collapsing or expanding, depending which direction of time you look in, um, spherically symmetric body with lambda equals zero. So here's like the simplest way to describe a collapsing system in general relativity. So you've got a collapsing ball of fluid surrounded by a vacuum. At some particular time, we impose a time reversal uh, symmetric initial data. So um, basically, you know, picture um, uh, the, the, the particles of the fluid and the ball are at rest with respect to each other at this time. So uh, if they collapse towards the future, they must also collapse towards the past. Uh, so in the central region, we're just going to have a homogeneous uh, ball of fluid. And in the exterior region, we're just going to have Schwarz, a slice of Schwarzschild geometry, temporal slice. So for positive T, we know what's going to happen. The ball is going to collapse under its own gravity, dis disappear behind a horizon, and leave us with a black hole. But the black hole will be sitting there in a future eternal uh, vacuum exterior that lo also looks like Schwarzschild. So uh, for negative T, we get the time reverse of that story. Uh, a past eternal vacuum containing a white hole, which is destroyed when this ball emerges out of it. So what we're going to do now is cook up uh, another solution with a different vacuum geometry near spatial infinity, but with the same matter and geometry in the central region. So this is going to be another counterexample to the Mach-Einstein principle because we're going to have, you know, exactly the, if you just look at the matter part, the uh, the ball of fluid, the spherically symmetric ball of fluid, it's going to look exactly the same in this original solution that's talked about on this slide and in the variant solution we're going to cook up. So here's the original solution. So the, you know, I, I'm terrible at making diagrams. This is the best I can do. The red part is the world tube of the ball of fluid, right? The jagged line at the bottom is the white hole. The jagged line on the top is the black hole. Um, and we're getting this uh, slice uh, sigma zero is uh, the moment when uh, 
you know, the ball shot out of the white hole. It's been expanding for a while. It's reached maximum radius. It's about to start collapsing. That's the moment of time we're fixing, fixing our attention on. Uh, and then the outer, uh, the, the black region here is vacuum. Okay, so uh, this part, uh, uh, sort of spherical geometry inside the ball, this part, Schwarzschild's law, Schwarzschild geometry. So now some points in the exterior region of our time slice can send uh, signals that will be received before the ball is destroyed by the black hole, right? So anything in here, yeah, you're gonna be able to signal uh, points on the world tube of the ball. Uh, but signals sent inward from points lying far enough outward on sigma zero will not reach the ball before it's destroyed. So if I'm way out here and I shine my light towards the, the center of the universe where the ball is, uh, it won't reach the ball before it's destroyed. So that signal will just be snuffed out by the black hole instead. So let's, still fixating on sigma zero, let's divide it into three regions. The interior matter field region, the exterior region, uh, the part of the exterior region where you can send signals to the ball, and the part of the exterior region where you can't send signals to the ball, right? So obviously this is finite in radius, this is finite in radius, because the way, conventions, the way we draw these diagrams, this looks small, but in fact, it's infinite in extent. Okay, and our goal is to create a new data set, a new initial data set on sigma zero that matches the given one in the red and green regions, but which differs in the blue region. Okay, this will determine a space time with the same matter configuration as before, right? Because we left everything untouched, not just in the red part of sigma zero, but also all along the green part of sigma zero. Um, so, you know, there's no, we're only changing things out here in the blue part, but nothing we do out here in the blue part can causally affect uh, anything that ever happens in the red part. Um, so we're gonna have a different uh, geometry out near spatial and null infinity out here, but it's not gonna make any difference to what happens in the, the, the part of the space time where the matter is. Now, it's not obvious we can do this. So we can't, for instance, just say that outside a transition zone, the blue, uh, part of sigma zero looks like uh, Minkowski space-time uh, because the positive energy theorem rules that out. Uh, but uh, we can do it. It's not obvious we can do it, but we can do it. So a gluing technique of, um, I will not attempt to say this Polish name and uh, delay, but I would very much like to know how to say it. Um, so I hope somebody will tell me later, but anyway, I'll just call them C and D for now. A gluing technique of C and D allows us to pose asymptotically flat uh, initial data on the blue region whose development is non-static. Okay, so remember, so we're like, basically we're able to fiddle with the initial data over here in a way that, um, you know, this part of the space-time was static in the original version. We're gonna fiddle with the geometry over here in such a way that when you evolve the thing, you get a non-static geometry in this part. Okay, so it's obviously not the same geometry as the one we started with. So since the new uh, solution is not static, it can't, also can't be spherically symmetric because of Birkhoff's theorem again. Uh, so here we have a vacuum exterior for a lambda equals zero spherically symmetric isolated body that is not spherically symmetric. Okay, so again, we uh, violate this sort of Curie's principle thing that tells you, um, you know, we, we were hoping that maybe if you fixed um, uh, what was going on in the matter part of space-time and it had a certain symmetry that everything that went on in the vacuum part would have to have the same symmetry. That turns out it's not true. Uh, the first counterexample showed it wasn't true when lambda was positive. The sixth counterexample shows it's true also when lambda vanishes. Um, and hence, it certainly differs from the original thing that we started with. So again, we have a counterexample uh, to the Mach-Einstein principle. Okay, one more slide, I think. So this is the conclusion. So. Uh, I think this just leaves us with a lot of uh, uh, questions, certainly more questions than I can answer. So um, one question that was already highlighted at the beginning of the talk is like, what is uh, what does 
Einstein's Mox principle require beyond mere supervenience? So he wants something stronger, some kind of asymmetric dependence maybe, but what exactly does he have in mind? Uh, it's hard to say. Another question is uh, just, you know, try to make life simple by working on electromagnetism instead of gravity. Does the uh, electromagnetic analog of the Mach Einstein principle hold or not, say in Abraham's theory? Uh, you might also ask uh, about other um, mathematically sensible forms of Maxwell's theory. Another one. Uh, so going back to the worry that Ehlers and Einstein raise, you might wonder what exactly are the ground rules? So what are the acceptable ways of specifying the material degrees of freedom upon which the geometric degrees of freedom are supposed to supervene? Uh, another question, okay, let's go beyond uh, static isolated bodies. You know, to what extent does the Mach-Einstein principle hold? Uh, what global structures cause problems for this kind of uh, principle? We've seen how to exploit black holes to make uh, problems for it. Uh, and finally, um, can a static body uh, emit exteriors with distinct asymptotic behaviors? Um, I don't know the answer to this one, I'm, but I'm very curious. Okay, so yes, I, thanks very much, and I'll leave you uh, with those questions. Uh, first in line, we have uh, Joanna Luz who raised her hand. So please, Joanna, go ahead. Uh, thank you. Uh, so um, first, um, the name you ask about uh, is pronounced Hrustel. Oh, okay. That's close. I, I might have. Yes. I always say in my head, crucial. But it's, yeah, it's what, cru crucial. 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 Yeah, I, it, it, it's won't. very difficult uh, for people who are not uh, native speakers. So All right. Polish language. Excellent. Thanks very much. Yes. And um, my main question is about um, your claim that we can sometimes uh, specify matter distribution without presupposing um, metric. And your, um, your example was um, uh, there, uh, I can say there's a blob of incompressible fluid of total mass m and uh, a density rho without having first specified a space-time metric. Um, and uh, my question is as follows. Um, doesn't uh, the claim that um, some blob of matter has mass m and um, mass density rho. Doesn't that presuppose the notion of volume of, or volume form, which in turn presupposes the notion of metric? So yeah. I'm, I'm reasoning as follows. If I have a blob of matter and it has a certain mass and a certain density, then this means that if I integrate this density, I will get this value of mass m. Mm -hmm. And the, 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 the order, of, the standard order of construction is that I need to have a metric uh, in order to uh, define uh, integration. Yes. So, I, I mean, I think I, I agree, honestly, that. Um, uh, it's in talking about something like density, um, you are presupposing the existence of some kind of geometric structure. Um, I just want to say what you're presupposing is not nearly enough to determine the space time metric. Um, uh, so, I mean, my. Um, sort of brute force way of doing that is to say, look, it, it could be either Newtonian or general relativistic. So uh, that, you know, you might be able to put two metrics on the same manifold that induce the same volume form, but one is a Lorentz metric and the other is, you know, one of these complicated uh, pre-relativistic things. Um, and so what you're, you know, it's, it's uh, I'm trying to short circuit this idea that 
um, you know, to specify the matter, it just is to specify the stress energy tensor, but the stress energy tensor is, you, you use the metric to define it. And so you must have the whole metric information on, on hand somehow. So I think that, I think that line of thought is, is wrong, but that but the kind of thing you're suggesting is right. Like you are presupposing at least some very weak uh, geometric information, but much weaker than um, uh, the precise metric. Okay, thank you. Are there other questions? Uh, Francisco, please go ahead. Uh, okay. Thanks for, for the talk. Um, I have a small clarificatory question uh, also about the uh, going from um, the idea of specifying the matter configuration of space-time to specifying the stress energy tensor. Mm. Uh, uh, and I would also like to ask about the, specifically the argument about formulating in terms of Newtonian gravity. I know you have these other arguments, but in full honesty, I uh, the Penrose diagrams, I, I can't really get them. So I, I would rather stick to the first one. Uh, so if you try to specify a stress energy tensor, um for this spherical shell or for the blobs how i mean i understand that you can do that in newtonian gravity without the need of a metric but for a general relativist theory how would you do that without oh, a metric yeah good yeah so i guess i'm sort of thinking um uh I agree that in order to specify the stress energy tensor, I would need to know the metric. Um, and I think um, I can, given that I can, well, sorry, maybe I should say that a little differently. Um, You know, given given what the laws, given the full laws of general relativity, um, saying um, that the only object in space time is a static blob of given total mass and given mass density um, fully determines everything, right? Um, it determines the geometry very far away from the blob. Um, it determines the stress energy tensor within the blob. It determines uh, uh, all, all kinds of things. Um, so I'm thinking um, in the presence of those laws, this apparently very small amount of information fixes everything. Um, but that I, that information is sort of neutral about what the laws are. Um, in the presence of other laws, uh, they would not necessarily fix the exterior geometry everywhere. They would not necessarily fix the stress energy tensor inside the blob. Um, they, they wouldn't, you know. So um, yeah, what's crucial to me is to think that um, there are ways of describing a matter configuration other than directly describing its stress energy tensor. Um, so that's one step. And then the second step is um, those, uh, depending on the case, um, there are at least sometimes ways of describing a matter configuration um, that's neutral on what the laws are. Um, so, uh, yeah. So I'm thinking, yeah, given, given the full laws of general relativity, yes, in giving that information, I am implicitly fixing the stress energy tensor, but it's not, that's, that's the work the laws are doing rather than the work that the 
that, that's work that's done jointly by the laws and the information I gave you that isn't done just by the information I gave you. And then I try to show that by saying, ah, look, here's, here's a case where the geometry is totally different, but the specification I gave you is equally true because there are different laws. Yeah, thank you. Okay, uh, other questions? Uh, Hans, please go ahead. Well, th th thank you, Antonio. Um, if, if, if there is time, I may maybe I can ask a probably stupid question, which brings us back to Newton or Kant or whatever. Um, if, if I look at practical solutions, when people do something with general relativity, somehow always the Minkowski metric pops up somewhere in the in the boundary conditions in, in asymptotic behavior, and I was wondering why don't I accept that and think of the, the, the mass distribution just determining the deviations or the modifications of Minkowski space. So, so in a sense, I would have this a priori or this given background Minkowski space, and then the, the whole question would be shifted to that the mass distribution determines the, the distortion of the underlying Minkowski space. Of course, that brings us back, and a lot of people will hate that, um, back to Kant in a sense, or the, the Minkowski version of Kant. I think I could happily live with that, and it would eliminate a lot of problems if that would be philosophically acceptable. But for some reason, that option seems to be not ever considered. Mm -hmm. Can yeah. you on that? Yes, yeah. So I think that's a very interesting suggestion. I'm I'm going to share the slides again because there's actually some extra slides um, uh, that touch on this topic. Um, um, so this was actually, um, yeah, a point that Einstein was very concerned about, and he thought that it was a flaw of the original version of general relativity without lambda. Uh, that it suggested exactly the picture that you're suggesting. So uh, think about like the very early days, the sort of process that you're talking about, like practical applications. Um, Einstein found an approximate uh, solution to his original field equations, describing the exterior uh, field of an isolated spherically symmetric body. So uh, basically, you know, an approximate Schwarzschild solution, and then Schwarzschild found the exact solution. You know, so 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 far so good as far as the Mach Einstein principle goes. You might think, right? Um, one might think that okay, they they started down the road towards showing that an isolated spherical body determines that special Schwarzschild exterior geometry. But that wasn't Einstein's view. Um, in his treatment and in Schwarzschild's, the space-time geometry is assumed to be as asymptotically flat at spatial infinity. As you proceed outwards towards, uh, you know, along a spatial geodesic in any direction, you get more and more like Euclidean space. In Einstein's mind, this meant that the principle, Mach's principle, is violated because the central mass isn't responsible for the exterior geometry. It's exactly as you were suggesting, only responsible for the deviations. But there's a kind of default background metric, which is the Minkowski metric. Um, this becomes most clear in a letter to Gustav Me. So he says. Uh, he's considering, you know, uh, uh, a path L that a body actually fall, follows, and a, uh, a another path L prime that it could have followed, um, that coincides with L of that initially and then diverges. He says, from the relativistic point of view, that the actually described path L be preferred over the, from the logical point of view, equally possible path L prime, on the basis of a real cause, which has the preference for L over L prime as a consequence. Mathematically, this means that the metric field must be completely determined by the stress energy tensor. This requirement is not satisfied by Newton's theory, but just as little by mine, as long as the world is conceived of as quasi Euclidean, i.e. asymptotically flat at um, spatial infinity. For then the metric, uh, the components of the metric tensor are predominantly fixed by non-relativistic boundary conditions at infinity. There's no, re then no real cause exists for the preference of certain paths over others. And so um, I think Einstein is here like feeling his way along the path that you're suggesting, but for him, 
it's unacceptable because uh, because he believes in this form of Mach's principle. Um, so the reasoning seems to be, suppose that all solutions of the field equations that represent isolated uh, systems are asymptotically flat at spatial infinity, then Minkowski geometry is in some sense the default space-time geometry. It represents how the world would be in the absence of matter and departure from flatness near gravitating bodies are due to those bodies. But in regions of space-time different from, uh, distant from any gravitating body, the spatial temporal geometry will depart from that of Minkowski space-time only to a minuscule extent. So we have to admit that in such regions, the geometry is largely determined by the fact that Minkowski space-time is playing uh, the role of default in the theory. Uh, so for Einstein, this was um, unacceptable, even though it's clearly consistent with the weak form of the Mach-Einstein principle. So for me, it's further evidence that he had something stronger in mind. Okay, but I think probably the question you're more interested in is like, what should we think about general relativity? Like, um, I mean, for instance, given that um, it appears that there is a positive cosmological constant, um, it's no longer Minkowski space-time itself that plays this role, right? I mean, um, except insofar as uh, it's not too misleading um, to pretend the cosmological constant doesn't exist because it's very small. But on large scales, at least, um, the role of the cosmological constant means that, um, for instance, the future of our universe will have a qualitatively different uh, behavior than it would if there was no lambda uh, at all. There's a way in which, um, you know, the De Sitter is the positive lambda analog of Minkowski space time. And in some ways, uh, De Sitter plays the same role in the positive lambda sector uh, that Minkowski space time plays in the lambda equals zero sector. In some ways, it doesn't. But there's a way in which De Sitter geometry is a much stronger dynamical attractor than Minkowski geometry. So um, it's thought that. Um, for almost any way of setting the initial data, if you have positive lambda, then in the distant future, your world looks more and more like De Sitter space time. That's definitely not true in the lambda equals zero case if you substitute Minkowski for De Sitter. So um, yeah, there's a way in which uh, De Sitter geometry is the default uh, geometry for general relativity with a positive cosmological constant. And it's like at early times or something, there's departures from De Sitter geometry when mass is all clumped up, but once it gets spread out, it almost inevitably looks more and more like De Sitter geometry. There's this interesting twist that um, it's not quite true that it's inevitable. So that has, it's, it's not like roughly speaking, the dynamics are determining um, asymptotic boundary conditions at future infinity. Namely, it should look like De Sitter. But that's only roughly speaking because there's a whole family of counterexamples of space times that even though you have positive lambda, they don't inevitably look more and more like De Sitter. Um, so it's a sort of uh, subtle and interesting mess, I think, is how I would put it. Thank you. Okay, uh, let's move on. Are there other questions? Lorenzo, please go ahead. Uh, yes, okay. uh, you said yourself that uh, there are many different uh, Mach principles and mm. you were looking at one of them, but can, can you maybe quickly summarize um, uh, the main ones that mm. yeah. yes you know if you'd asked me a year ago i could have because i was uh deep deeply immersed in this project uh now my memory is somewhat vague but i would say um uh especially in the period before 1916 he would often say things like um you know, the inertia of a body should depend on how far away from it other bodies are, as a uh, formulation of Mach's principle. Um, after 1918, um, he, so I guess maybe this is the way of putting it in the Princeton lectures, 
on general relativity, which are around 1920, Einstein um, talks extensively about rotation and especially about the uh, th lens theoring effect that there'll be, there should be frame dragging uh, for a body at rest in a, at the center of a rotating shell that wouldn't be there if the shell wasn't rotating. And he sort of makes that um, the criterion of Mach's principle. It becomes more and more central to the way he thinks about it. And I think it, in the literature, it sort of gets taken up as the main form of Mach's principle. Um, although in Einstein's act, you know, in Einstein's writing, I, ideas from one period often persist in other periods and keep, you know, are, are casually mentioned in some contexts. And um, so it, there is a kind of complicated um, uh, textual history of his discussions of Mach's principle. Yeah, th thanks. Yeah, sure, it's complicated. I, I remember once Julian Barbour saying that uh, he had proven that general relativity satisfies Mach principle together with, uh, with uh, Bruno Bertotti. And then I asked uh, Bruno Bertotti and he said, Oh, that's absolutely not the case. We never did such a thing. <laughs> so, yeah, I guess they were probably thinking, speaking of different versions of Mark. <laughs> Let's hope so. Okay, the next question. Well, I think it comes from me and uh, uh, let's get uh, metaphysical. Mm. You mentioned this uh, dependence relation that holds between uh, material facts and uh, geometric facts. You've said, you've cast that in, in terms of supervenience, okay? And then you said that it's a bit weak of a, uh, of a relation. How yeah. can we uh, make something more more strong. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, th this is a, a kind of a, a question that I got me very interested in in the last years, and it's a very difficult question because uh, the first problem is that uh, if we want to make this uh, uh, relation asymmetric, then we have to face uh, uh, Wheeler, Misner, Thorns, uh, motto that you have shown uh, at the beginning mm -hmm. that seems to capture very well the, the spirit of uh, the interdependence between space time and matter. But even if we want to go over and we try to find another dependence relation which is asymmetric, like uh, causality, causation, or grounding. Mm -hmm we found ourselves in, in big trouble because it doesn't seem that uh, Einstein's equations, uh, let's say support uh, a, a causation or grounding feature very much. So I, I'm curious to know your point of view on uh, this kind of conundrum. Yes, so I'm, I'm undecided is my point of view. So um, I think, you know, on the, as far as interpreting Einstein goes, um, I think there's some uh, evidence that he would have resisted a causal formulation. Uh, uh, it's, but it's, it's. I, I won't bore you with the slides. It's uh, a, a verging on philo philology or something. Um, just like the, his word choice in various places, the things he crosses out. I mean, it just seems like he. He considers uh, saying, you know, causally determined instead of determined, and then he just crosses it out uh, over and over again. So it just seems like he, there was something that he resisted in this. Of course, you know, everybody writing in this period, but especially in the German speaking world, like is writing under the shadow of Kant. So uh, it could just be that it just seemed like heretical um, to speak of uh, space and time as being caused by something. Um, I'm not sure. Um, okay, so that's, yeah, Einstein interpretation. Then, yeah, for a modern person interested in making sense of this stuff. So, I mean, uh, 
I think it'd be interesting to see how far you could go with causal language. I mean, I didn't talk about um, uh, Lawrence's attitude towards electromagnetism, but he essentially, I think, does believe in the uh, electromagnetic version of the Mach-Einstein principle, and he gives it a causal interpretation. He sort of says, like, okay, there's this, you know, vast um, uh, number of solutions. Uh, well, let me put it this way: that we should only be interested in solutions in which um, the charge matter uh, causes the field. And he's working in a representation where you have point particles, and so for him, that's saying, um, look at um, uh, the retarded solutions only, uh, you know, for a point corresponding to a point charge. And you can give a sort of causal story about why how you single those out. Right, you're like ah, I mean, I want the matter to, to be the cause, so I'm only interested in things that are concentrated on the future light cone, um, and that share the symmetries. You know, so I think you can make sense of what Lawrence is doing in causal terms. There's a question of how much you could carry that over to the setting of general relativity. Um, I mean, definitely, you know, in some of the things, some of the papers Einstein's working on in this period are about gravitational waves and. In those papers, he basically is using uh, the linearized approximation and always working with retarded solutions, a trick that De Sitter taught him. Um, and so within that project, uh, as long as you're only looking at the, you know, the, the linearized version of general relativity, it's so similar to Maxwell's theory that anything you can do in Maxwell's theory, you can probably do in linearized general relativity as well. The problem is getting it into the nonlinear, the full nonlinear theory, whether you could make sense of the causal thing. The whole thing about, um, you know, Green's functions and fundamental solutions and all that doesn't really make sense in general relativity. So um, there's a kind of big project there, I think, for somebody who's interested in making sense of a causal, uh, the language of causation in general relativity. As for grounding, I don't know what to think. You know, to me, um, I, I I do think I know in some applications of the notion of grounding, I, I do feel like I, I understand it and I understand how it's stronger than mere uh, uh, supervenience. Um, but when people try to give me a general account of what grounding is, I often um, am puzzled. So for instance, people will sometimes say, well, it's the kind of explanatory dependence that isn't causal. Um, and I'm just not sure there is just one kind that isn't causal. And I mean, one reason why I brought up uh, Newton on space and time as the eminent effect of God is because on the one hand, um, it does seem like a, a place where if we were writing, if we were trying to make the points he's trying to make, we might resort to grounding. On the other hand, you know, he instead reaches for this um, Neoplatonist language of eminent causes and effects. Um, uh, as if like the distinction between causation and grounding maybe isn't um, necessarily as sharp as we normally take it to be. So I'm just puzzled um, about how to make sense of, you know, I know I, I'm very confident that Einstein wanted something stronger than supervenience and I'm not sure. And I'm pretty confident that he wouldn't himself have put it in causal terms. And I'm not sure what the best way of understanding him is. Okay, thank you. Um, we have another question from Joanna, so please go ahead. Um, thank you. It's a follow up. Uh, so, another way to strengthen uh, the concept of supervenience is uh, the concept of reduction. Mm. Do you think it could be applicable here? Yeah, I don't know. It's, it's, it's an interesting question. I don't know. Um, it's um, yeah, I'm not sure. So in the, like, say it turns out that, yeah, well, like in the case where we're imagining all there is is this one blob of fluid and the exterior is Schwarzschild, I mean, It would seem strange to me to say that the geometry very far from the star reduced to 
facts about the star. Um, but that's just an initial reaction. I don't know uh, whether um, there's ways around that kind of uh, hesitancy or not. Um, I think like all these, I mean, I think I, uh, I think it's worth trying to work out um, um, because yeah, I mean, we only have so many uh, models of asymmetric dependence relations. Uh, uh, yeah, none of them seem to fit this case perfectly. So um, yeah, I think pushing each of them as far as you can is, uh, is a good idea. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Hans, please go ahead. A, a question motivated by your remark that one can view a mass distribution as continuous or as kind of discrete, mm. um, anchored in points. Yeah? So for this distribution of the energy momentum tensor, if I take the continuous point of view, then it's clear that it breaks down at some point if I get down to atomistic scales or so. I, I don't want to talk about quantum mechanics, just the fact that there is a lower limit where continuum descriptions might not make sense. And then I have the typical problems as I have them in hydrodynamics. I'm lost because I don't even know what I mean by solution. I mean, the, the, the question, mm. what is a solution at all to a problem becomes very non-trivial and, and, and requires the introduction of proper spaces and, and handling of limits in a sense. What do I do with a, with a short length scale limits? And, and, and even as a classical continuum mechanical problem. And so somehow the whole setup seems to be restricted anyway. I mean, it can only be valid in a certain range of scales and, and probably in a nonlinear equation one will inevitably run into renormalization problems of difficult ways of, of explaining what happens at very short scales and eliminating those effects. Is, is that a problem? Yeah, I mean, I think it is, it seems to me like a very fundamental problem uh, about general relativity that it, um, it um, if you want to put matter in, um, it what it works best with is nice smooth uh, forms of matter, you know, fluids, dust, radiation, various kinds of fields. Um, uh, it would be very hard to give a realistic, you know, to push our models of stars to be more and more realistic and can try to continue to work with general relativity um, because of the some of the difficulties that you're mentioning. I mean, there are, there is a sort of compromise where you, um, uh, work in kinetic theory um, and, you know, you, you attempt to deal with um, particulate matter um, at the level of statistical distributions, which then have the kind of smoothness that uh, works well in general relativity. And I think it's a very intriguing fact that um, uh, for some purposes, the Einstein Vlasov equations, you know, this uh, sort of, you know, um, uh, simplified version of general relativity plus the Boltzmann equation uh, are much better behaved than the Einstein Euler equations. Um, um, yeah, I think it's intriguing. I don't, I don't know quite what to make out of that, uh, but maybe it's encouraging. Maybe I should say, maybe it's encouraging that um, it might suggest that there is uh, a better prospects of making sense of particulate matter in general relativity than it might at first appear. Next in line, we have uh, Pedro. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Gordon, for, for your talk. Uh, first of all, I feel kind of compelled to put a finger on Lorenzo's uh, remarks because regarding how many Mach principles, and of course not all of them, but uh, when uh, and in, in, in particular Julian and Bruno Bertotti's one. So, uh, Lorenzo, yeah, I mean, it's uh, certainly the case that uh, Julian and Bruno, I mean, don't use uh, the original version of, uh, of Mac because uh, 
Mark, uh, as, as Gordon has uh, thoroughly emphasized during his talk, I mean, put an emphasis on, on, on the distribution of matter as uh, basically defining inertial frames, blah, blah. So what, what Julian and Bruno did is basically what uh, now is known as the Mach Poincaré principle, because it was Poincaré was basically in his uh, science and hypothesis book, basically uh, definitely put, I mean, the, into precise mathematical uh, uh, framework. I mean, the, the problem is that any relational theory faces in order to account for this. And so the original is that uh, in, uh, Basically, you just need in frames in terms of what they call uh, shape space, which is just uh, the conversion space when you get rid of uh, any symmetries and you are just uh, with a shape space. So this Mach Poincaré principle reads as follows: This is Bruno and Barbus uh, uh, coining is uh, you just need a a point, so a configuration on 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 your curve, which basically is. Uh, uh, a universal configuration of, of that uh, your system at that instant, and you have to force either the weak, which is just a tangent vector, or the form or a, or a strong form, which is uh, just um, a direction. So just a point in either a direction or a tangent vector uniquely determines the evolution of your system. That's basically the content of uh, Mach Poincaré, and this is important. And this is now to you, Gordon. <laughs> Uh, this is important because uh, it follows, as, as stated, it only applies to closed systems. Because one thing that is uh, uh, Julian has been championed uh, for decades is the, that basically the universe uh, is uh, its own clock, so to speak. So he puts emphasis on closed systems. You mentioned in your talk some uh, issues about uh, boundary conditions. So this is something that basically goes outside this, uh, this framework. So uh, because only with closed system can you basically explain our rotations and you basically get rid of these uh, counter examples that come from rotation because uh, it automatically basically explains, I mean, well, imposes as a constraint on your theory that the angular moment, the total angular moment of your universe, intended as a, as a closed, uh, is the only truly closed system there is, is zero. So now my question is, uh, well, that's for methodical reasons. I mean, I sympathize with that view, but uh, perhaps uh, you, the literature, I mean, of course, has some objections on, on basically whether this is uh, a fair, if per approach in the sense of only restricting ourselves to closed systems. And so there are, in, in this uh, program of, of, of uh, Julian's, I mean, there are mathematical basic problems treating, for example, black holes. I mean, uh, there is uh, some ongoing research on, on that line, but it seems some uh, technicalities issue. Mm -hmm. So well, what are, your thoughts, um, generally speaking, on, on basically this closed versus uh, uh, non-closed uh, system and, and in general, so. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm, I'm very interested in that. Um, I uh, think- let, let me just, thank you. Uh, th thank you, Pedro, thanks. That was- Ah, yeah, you, you are most welcome, you are most welcome. <laughs> so. Um, uh, yeah, no, I think that's very interesting, I think, um, it's a sort of fascinating thing that, um, um, you know, in the original, or maybe the like 1980 era, uh, Barber and Bertotti thing that you could get, um, yeah, basically full Newtonian mechanics back for subsystems, including the possibility of rotation uh, uh, within this framework in which the, the, the global system couldn't be rotating. Um, I don't know myself what to make of the fact that um, it's so much harder to work um, with, um, like take the three body problem in Newtonian mechanics, for instance. Um, 
you know, if we just pretend the complete system is uh, three point particles, uh, you know, I could write down the um, equations of motion in the Newtonian framework, you know, using very, very few symbols. Whereas if I try to spell them out completely um, using the relative variables, um, it's going to be um, maybe 10 times longer. Um, I don't know, you know, whether we should care or not. Uh, you know, uh, speaking for myself as a philosopher, I don't know whether that's uh, uh, the kind of difference between two approaches that uh, we should think of as um, having more than just practical significance. And then, of course, you know, physicists, um, I also don't know whether they should, uh, uh, they should care. Like the fact that we live in this large universe and we know that Newtonian mechanics works fine for subsystems. Uh, Newtonian mechanics is simpler than the Barbara Portati kind of approach. Um, uh, is it just a sort of question of principle about the global thing, a sort of almost philosophical question, or is it a more practical physics question? I'm not, I'm not sure what to think about that. Um, uh, but um, yes, I am certainly very interested in it. Okay, thanks. Uh, just one mi minor, because I forgot. Just sure. uh, Go ahead. okay to emphasize on on, on, the, on the fact that uh, Mach Poincaré principle in in, in Barbour taught. I mean, there are of course uh, models, uh, vacuum models that uh, basically implement this uh, Mach Poincaré principle. Mm. For example, mm -hmm. there are vacuum Bianchi nine cosmological models uh -huh. that uh, to because this is uh, something that. I mean, very recently, I mean, uh, Flavio Mercati and David Sloan have uh, successfully implemented this uh, Machian, so to speak, approach uh, of Julian's in, uh, in order to get rid of singularities in, in, in this uh, Vancunai, Bianchinai yeah. cosmological, in vacuum. So, so to emphasize that right. contra, right. Mach, contra Mach, we don't need any sort of, of matter, but... Uh, right. Right. Yeah, that's very yes. interesting. I um, yes, I, I'm uh, uh, yeah. I intend to uh, to look up those papers. Okay. So thank you very much. Oh.